John Mies. He's a visualization engineer at Hex Technologies, and he's going to tell us about Mega Fusion. Take it, let's give him a round of applause and take it away. All right. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. I really appreciate this opportunity to talk with you all about this work to scale Altair visualizations with Vega Fusion. To quickly introduce myself, my name is John Meese. I'm a visualization engineer at Hex. I'm the creator and maintainer of Vega Fusion and a contributor to Altair. In past lives, I've worked with Plotly and Anaconda on uh, Plotly, Dash, Data Shader, Hollow Views, and a couple other projects in the PyData visualization ecosystem. So I've been thinking about visualization in Python for, for quite some time now. Here's an outline of what we're going to cover today. First, why I think Altair is a great option for exploratory visualization in Python. Then I'll talk through some significant limitations of Altair related to data set size and accessing transformed, uh, transformed data. I'm going to walk through how Vega Fusion solves these limitations with a couple of demos. We'll look briefly at how Vega Fusion works. And then I'll mention some additional applications of the core Vega Fusion technology. All right, let's jump in. So why Altair? There are six areas I'm going to touch on. First, Altair's API is declarative. So you spend your focus on how data should be mapped to various elements of your chart, rather than focusing on writing lots of imperative steps to build up a chart step by step. Its API is composable. The individual concepts that you learn can be freely combined to build up sophisticated charts from simple components. Altair includes a suite of built-in data transformations, which reduces the need to jump back and forth between pandas and your charting library as you're iterating on visualizations. One of the most unique features of Altair is that it includes support for interactivity in a way that gives you a lot of control over how chart interactions behave. Altair's popularity is growing. And Altair 5, which is going to be out shortly, uh, is make, going to make Altair even better. This section is going to include, include several examples that reference this cars data set from the Vega datasets package. Throughout the examples, this data frame is going to be named cars underscore df. It has 406 rows, and here are the columns that we're going to use. There's the miles per gallon for each car, the number of cylinders, the displacement, horsepower, and the country of origin, one of Europe, Japan, or USA. Our first example of Altair's declarative API is this faceted scatter plot. We're plotting horsepower versus miles per gallon and faceting by country of origin. In a declarative visualization API like Altair's, the code that you write specifies the requirements for the final chart. The details of how to build a chart that satisfies these requirements is left up to the library. We'll start by importing Altair and then wrap the car's data frame in an Altair chart. Method chaining syntax is used to say that we want to plot circles. Altair calls plot primitives, like circles, uh, points, lines, and bars, that calls these marks. Altair uses the concept of encoding to map data columns to mark properties, like position, color, and size. Here we're saying that we want the x position of the circles to correspond to the horsepower column, the y position to correspond to the miles per gallon column, and the origin column to correspond to the subplot row. Now let's contrast this declarative implementation of this plot with an imperative specification in Matplotlib. So in an imperative visualization API like Matplotlib, you specify the individual steps required to build up the chart. This yields more control oftentimes, but it's up to the visualization author to ensure that the steps that you choose uh, result in a chart that matches the intended requirements. Let's walk through this example. First, import pyplot. And then before anything else, we need to compute the set of unique origin values so that we know how many subplots we're going to need. Then create a figure with one subplot row for each origin value. We'll loop over the subplot axis and origin pairs, and then filter the input data frame to include only those rows for the given country of origin. Create a scatter plot using the horsepower and miles per gallon columns of the filtered data frame. And then set the x and y axis labels. Then set the x and y axis limits to run from 0 to the global max value of horsepower and miles per gallon. If we don't set the axis limits this way, then each subplot would have independent axis limits and they wouldn't, wouldn't line up. Now looking back at the Altair example, you can see that its declarative nature means that Altair can handle a lot of low-level details uh, on its own. It automatically determines how many subplots are required, 
It automatically uh, labels the axes to correspond to the encoding columns. And it automatically computes the axis ranges and synchronizes them across the subplots. All this is not to say that imperative APIs like matplotlibs are, are bad. They typically offer more low-level control, but this control comes at the cost of being more cumbersome for exploratory use. As a side note, matplotlibs is a great foundation to build on, and there are several declarative visualization libraries that are built on top of matplotlib, including Seaborn and Plot9. So that's how Altair's API is declarative. Next, I'm going to talk about composability. So what does this mean? Um, the way that I think about it in the context of Altair is that if you know how to accomplish feature A and you know how to accomplish feature B, then you can be confident that you can combine these two features together and Altair will do the right thing. Here's a simple example. In the left column, we have a specification for a scatter plot of horsepower versus miles per gallon where the points are colored by the country of origin. Altair automatically adds a helpful color legend that's labeled origin. The center column, in the center column, no color encoding is provided, and the points are sized based on the engine displacement column. Now, Altair produces a point size legend where the border color matches the default blue used in the chart. Composability means that we can be confident that you can use the color and size encodings together, and Altair will do the right thing. Now, the points are colored by country of origin and sized by displacement. Both legends are included and nicely laid out. You can notice also that the size legend has switched from blue to gray to indicate that the color and size are now varying independently. This is a really simple example, but the com this composability property works throughout Altair, and once you get used to it, it gives you a lot of confidence in using the API. All right, next, Altair has built-in support for data transformations. We're going to look at a simple example where this is useful. We're going to create a bar chart of the average miles per gallon for each cylinder count for only the USA origin cars. To create this chart in matplotlib, we first use pandas to filter the data frame to only those rows of origin USA, then group by cylinders and compute the mean. We'll reset the index to create a cylinder underscore means data frame, which has one row for each cylinder count. Create a bar chart from the cylinder means data frame and then set the axis labels and title. This approach works, but there are some downsides. The same column needs to be specified in multiple places. If you want to change the x-axis column from cylinders to something else, you would need to modify the code in these three places. Or if you want to change the y-axis column from miles per gallon to something else, you would need to make these three updates. And if you change the mean aggregation to, say, a median, you need to make sure to modify both the pandas aggregation and the y-axis label to make sure they're consistent. Here's how the same chart can be created with Altair. We'll wrap the car's data frame in an Altair chart, and then use the transform filter method to keep only those rows with origin USA. The expression, uh, then, then we create a bar mark and encode cylinders as the X position. And for the Y position, use the expression mean miles per gallon. Finally, set the title to USA cars. By incorporating data transformations into the chart specification this way, we remove the duplication and can now quickly edit the X column, Y column, and chart aggregation, and everything will stay consistent. This approach also allows Altair to automatically label the Y axis with the aggregation that was used, in this case, the mean. All right, Altair includes an expressive selections framework, which can be used to build up sophisticated interactive charts. You have full control over how selections affect the visual appearance of marks and how they filter the underlying data. Selections are part of the chart specification itself, and so the interactive behavior is self-contained and doesn't require a running Python kernel. It means that interactive charts work in saved notebooks and when charts are embedded in websites without Python. All other interactive Python libraries that I'm aware of require the use of Python callbacks to configure their interactive behavior, and so they require a running Python kernel in order to operate. Here's a simple example of an interactive bar chart with cylinder count on the x-axis and average miles per gallon on the y-axis. The chart supports interval selection, and a horizontal red rule is overlaid with the average miles per gallon of all of the selected cars. And Altair's popularity is growing. As of this month, Altair is the second most downloaded Python visualization library from PyPI, behind only matplotlib. There are a lot of great resources available online for learning Altair and a growing community. The first release candidate of Altair 5 is now available. This is the first new major version of Altair in several years and includes some exciting new features. There are improvements to the method chaining syntax to make it more ergonomic. 
exporting charts, the static images like SVG and PNG, has been dramatically simplified. It no longer requires an external web browser or Node.js installation or Selenium or anything like that. Uh, there's improved support for grouped bar charts, and support for non-pandas data frames like Polars was added using the data frame interchange protocol. So I hope I gave you a quick taste of why I think Altair is a great choice for exploratory visualization. Uh, but on its own, it has some significant limitations. To outline this section, we're going to look at the limit that stock Altair places on data set size. We'll talk about how it's not possible to access the transformed data in Python. Then we'll look at a workaround mentioned in the Altair documentation and explain why it's not a full satisfactory solution. This section is going to include several examples that reference a 1 million row flights data set named flights underscore df. This includes columns for the flight date and time, the number of minutes the flight was delayed, and the distance of the flight in miles. Let's create a histogram of the flight distances. We'll wrap the first 5,000 rows of the data frame in an Altair chart, and I'll explain why 5,000 in a moment. Then create a bar mark and encode the distance column as the x position, binned into approximately 20 bins, and then use the count of entries per bin as the y encoding. This works well and creates the plot shown here. But now instead of just the first 5,000 rows, we'll pass all 1 million rows into this chart. This results in an Altair max rows error. So Altair performs its data transformations, like histogram binning and aggregation in this case, uh, performs those in, in the browser. So it needs access to the entire input data set in order to perform those transformations. But to avoid crashing the browser with too much data, by default, Altair imposes a 5,000 row limit and raises this error when the limit is exceeded. Here's another limitation. Let's go back to the example that only uses 5,000 rows to avoid the max rows error. Exactly how many flights are there between 200 and 400 miles? From the chart, we can see that it's a little bit less than 2,400. Uh, but there's no way to extract this exact number from the chart to use in downstream processing in Python. And again, the reason for this is that Altair is performing these data transformations in the browser, and so the results are not readily available in Python. A workaround for both of these limitations that's described in the Altair documentation is to move the data transformation steps outside of Altair and then pass the transformed data into the chart. To demonstrate this, we'll use the NumPy histogram function on the distance column of the flights data frame, to, and this will produce the bin edges and counts. And we use these to build a distance underscore df data frame, which now includes one row for each histogram bin. This solves the max rows error because the data frame will pass to the Altair chart now has only 10 rows instead of a million. It also solves the problem of accessing the transformed data since now these values are readily available in Python as a data frame for downstream processing. We'll wrap this distance underscore df data frame in a chart and create a rectangle mark using the start and end edges and the bin count for the height. This gets us close, uh, but it's still not quite right. So NumPy's histogram function uses the min data value as the first edge in the histogram, and then uses the max data value as the final edge, and then evenly divides the range into 10 bins by default. Altair's approach is a bit smarter and chooses human-friendly bin edges that align with the axis ticks. We could get a closer match by passing an explicit range and number of bins to the NumPy histogram function, but computing this range and number of bins is not trivial to do the way Altair does. Also, because we perform the data transformation outside of Altair, we lost the automatic x-axis labeling. Um, and so here it has the start edge and uh, end edge instead of what we wanted. So this approach can work, but it's sad to lose so much of what's great about Altair when your data set exceeds 5,000 rows or when you need access to the transformed data in Python. This approach is also incompatible with the charts that filter data in response to interactive selections. So we couldn't use this approach with the average miles per gallon by cylinder count example we saw earlier in the video earlier. Now let's talk about Vega Fusion. Vega Fusion solves these limitations so that you can take advantage of everything that's great about Altair, even as your data set size increases and the transform data is required in Python. Vega Fusion provides three main features. The first is the Vega Fusion MIME render, which automates this transformed in Python workflow that we just talked about by automatically pre-evaluating data transformations in the Python kernel instead of the browser. Vega Fusion provides a function to extract transformed data from an Altair chart so that it can be used in downstream processing in Python. 
And finally, Vega Fusion provides a widget renderer, which is specifically designed to support charts that perform interactive data transformations in response to selections. Let's look at the MIME renderer. The Vega Fusion MIME renderer is enabled by importing Vega Fusion and calling the VegaFusion.enable function. When enabled, data transformations and Altair charts are automatically pre evaluated in the Python kernel before being displayed. Unused data columns are also removed automatically to reduce the size of the data so that it gets loaded into the browser. This approach makes it possible to scale most Altair charts to millions of rows as long as they include some form of aggregation. Here's the same distance histogram that raised the max rows error with stock Altair. With the Vega Fusion MIME render enabled, it renders quickly and without an error. This approach reuses the existing Altair chart rendering infrastructure, so it's compatible with every Jupyter-based environment that already supports Altair. So this includes Jupyter Notebooks, Jupyter Lab, Visual Studio Code, and online notebook services like Colab, Hex, Notable, SageMaker, and, and many others. VegaFusion also provides this transform data function that accepts an Altair chart and returns the transformed data as a pandas data frame. Here's an example of what this looks like for the flight for the flight distance histogram. We can see that the returned pandas data frame contains 12 rows, one for each bin, and contains columns for the each bin edge and the histogram count. This data frame can be used to easily look up the count and number of records for a particular distance range. And the Vega Fusion MIME render and transform data function together, they completely remove the need to rewrite Altair's data transformations in pandas. Here's a quick demo of what this looks like in a notebook workflow. I'm going to use hex for this example, but again, this works exactly the same way in any Jupyter-based notebook environment that supports Altair. First, I'll load the 1 million row flights data set using the pandas read parquet function, then display this data frame using a table view. And with this table view, we can see that the data frame does, in fact, have a million rows. Next, we'll wrap this data frame in an Altair chart and create a histogram of flight distances. This results in the max rows error, as the data set has more than 5,000 rows. Then import VegaFusion and call the VegaFusion.enable function to, and then redisplay the chart. And now displays, and now displays here quickly without an error. And to access the transform bin counts, we use VegaFusion's transform data function. And this produces a data frame with one row per histogram bin and columns for the bin edges and counts. Now, this is the VegaFusion widget renderer. Rather than pre-transform data before rendering the chart, the VegaFusion widget renderer maintains a live connection between the kernel and the browser and transforms data in response to selections. This provides full support for interactivity, and, but to enable this live connection, the widget renderer relies on a custom Jupyter widget extension. So unlike the MIME renderer, the widget renderer is only compatible with compute environments that support third-party Jupyter widgets. To enable the widget renderer, import VegaFusion and call the enable underscore widget function, and then create and display the chart as usual. Here's a demo of what this looks like in a notebook environment. I'm going to use JupyterLab for the, in this case, as the widget render requires support for custom third-party widgets. First, we'll look at the interactive cross-filter example from the Altair documentation. This uses the Altair selections framework to implement cross-filtering across distance, delay, and time histograms. This example uses a 2,000 row flights data set to ensure that everything fits comfortably in memory in the browser. Now we'll jump over to JupyterLab, and we'll enable the widget render and then load the 1 million row flights data set using the pandas read parquet function. I've copied the exact chart specification from the gallery and updated it to feed in the 1 million row data set. Even with a million rows, cross-filtering is smooth and responsive. Each selection update is sent to the Vega Fusion runtime in the Python kernel to refilter and re-aggregate the selected data. This way, the full million row data set is never sent to the browser. And for the final demo, I want to push the scale a bit further. Here we're using a data set with information on 10 million New York City taxi rides. The left chart is a histogram of trip distances. The middle chart is a fine-grained heat map of taxi pickup locations. The Altair Selections framework is used to re-bin and re-aggregate the pickup locations in response to pan and zoom events. It also supports interval selections. The selections on all three of these charts are linked by cross-filtering using the Altair filter transform and the selections framework. The right chart is a heat map of the tip to fare ratio bin by hour of the day and day of the week. So how does VegaFusion work? 
First, we're going to look at Vega Lite and Vega and the role that they play, and then show um, how they're used in the standard Altair architecture. And then we'll look at how Vega Fusion modifies this architecture to support scaling Altair charts to large data sets. Altair relies on two web-based visualization libraries, Vega Lite and Vega. Vega Lite is a high-level visualization library written in TypeScript. It accepts Vega Lite chart specifications and then compiles them into Vega specifications. Vega is a low-level visualization library written in JavaScript. It accepts Vega specifications and renders them in the browser using SVG or Canvas. Both of these libraries were created by the University of Washington's Interactive Data Lab under the direction of Jeff Heer. Altair's primary job is to provide an ergonomic Python interface for building Vega Lite JSON specifications. These Vega Lite JSON specifications are passed to the browser for conversion to Vega and then rendering using SVG or Canvas. Vega Fusion works at the Vega specification level. The Vega Fusion planner performs a deep analysis of the Vega chart specification to identify data transformations that can be evaluated on the server, which in this case is a Python kernel. These server eligible transformations are extracted into a server Vega spec that is then processed by the Vega Fusion runtime. The client Vega specification with the data transformations removed is passed to the standard Vega JavaScript library for rendering. For interactive charts displayed using the widget renderer, messages are sent back and forth between the, the Vega and Vega between Vega and the Vega Fusion runtime to maintain the interactivity of the original Vega specification. Some quick notes on the technologies that Vega Fusion is using. Both the planner and the runtime are written in Rust. In the case of the widget renderer, the planner is compiled to WebAssembly to run in the browser. The runtime implements Vega's data transformations using the Apache Arrow Data Fusion library, which is a Rust library, and it's compiled to Python using Py03. Uh, to learn more about writing Python libraries in Rust, there's a talk tomorrow by Carl Katie that looks really helpful. It's called Nine Rules for Writing Python Extensions in Rust. And finally, the messages exchanged between the runtime and the client are in binary protocol buffer format and take advantage of Apache Arrow for serializing data frames. In the last few minutes, I want to quickly touch on features of Vega Fusion that extend beyond scaling Altair charts that wrap Pandas data frames. We'll look at Vega Fusion support for Polars and its support for DuckDB, and how Vega Fusion can support graphical chart editors that produce Vega Lite. So Polars describes itself as a lightning fast data frame library for Rust and Python. Polars has quickly gained popularity as a faster alternative to Pandas that also supports larger data sets. Combined with Altair 5 support for the data frame interchange protocol, Vega Fusion adds support for building Altair charts directly from Polar's data frames and evaluating their data transformations in the Python kernel without converting through Pandas. This integration makes Altair and Vega Fusion a great visualization solution for Polar's users and also makes Polar's an attractive alternative to Pandas for Altair users. So Vega Fusion converts Vega transformations into SQL queries internally. These queries are usually evaluated by the embedded Data Fusion runtime, but we've recently added support for specializing the generated SQL for evaluation in other SQL query engines, like DuckDB. DuckDB is an in-process SQL query engine and database that provides bindings for a wide variety of languages, including Python. Additionally, while it's not all wired up yet, we have the foundation in place now to connect Vega Fusion to a wide range of SQL databases and data warehouses. So if you're interested in using Vega Fusion with a database like Postgres or a data warehouse like Snowflake, uh, please reach out and let us know. I'd love to talk, to talk to you about that. And because Vega Fusion works at the level of Vega specifications, it can support Vega and Vega Lite use cases beyond Altair. For example, Vega Lite is a great target for graphical chart editors, and Vega Fusion can be used to scale these editors to support much larger data sets by moving their data transformations to, to a server. This is exactly how the graphical chart editor works in Hex. If you're building a web application that produces Vega or Vega Lite specifications, please reach out. I'd love to talk to you about how Vega Fusion could fit into your architecture to scale uh, to larger data sets. To learn more, check out the project website at vegafusion.io for the, docu the documentation and their blog. See the Vega Fusion GitHub project under the Hex Inc. GitHub org for the Vega Fusion code base, issue tracker, and discussion board. And if you're interested in what we're building, stars are appreciated. And finally, follow the project on Twitter at VegaFusion underscore IO for release announcements. Thank you very much.
if there are any questions, I'd be happy to talk more about it. Otherwise, lunch is, lunch is next. That's good. Yeah. I think everybody's like, uh, what do you say now? <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> um, I'm asking this question just because a lot of the examples that you showed were maybe a little more sophisticated than what I'm curious about, which is, you know, does it behave well? Uh, th does everything you said hold true for like doing a simple like 2D or 3D interactive plot with a huge number? Of, of so as long as it includes some sort of aggregation. It, it does. If you're doing like a scatter plot, then nothing is aggregated, then you're still going to run into the limits of data set size in the browser. So Altair and Vega, um, and Vega Lite, they're not like GPU accelerated for rendering like lots and lots of scatter points. That's not a case that they're very well optimized for yet. Um, but for things like histograms or like that fine grained heat map that I showed for the taxi data set, um, there you're doing some aggregation even at the pixel level that helps a lot. And the aggregation can happen, happen in, in the server. Yeah. Do you have these slides available anywhere? I will post them. I'll, I'll uh, probably tweet them out on the Vega Fusion Twitter page if you want to follow that. It's probably the easiest way to get them out there. Uh, and I'll do that shortly. So, you know, everybody loved Python so much they started writing JavaScript a few years back. Uh huh. And uh, you've kind of followed that trajectory here, and you're experienced at these large scale visualizations. Is everybody moving to Rust? Like, what's your, how, how has Rust changed what you're able to do since you've been tinkering with these things for so long? Um, I mean, I, I see the, the option now of writing Python libraries in Rust is, I see it as a sort of new evolution of how things used to be written in Fortran, and they still are, but how in older libraries were written in Fortran and then wrapped in Python. Um, by writing in Rust, you have access to a lot of nice libraries and nice package manager. Um, and there's uh, the Apache Arrow library in Rust is really, really helpful. And so that was a nice foundation to, to build on. So um, I mean, I have worked on a lot of Python libraries that were intending to be very fast in Python, like Data Shader, where you do a lot of um, work with Numba and other tricks to get a lot of performance out of Python. And those work, work really well. Um, Rust is another approach to doing that, where you can um, do everything at a native level and then provide a nice Python wrapper around it. And that's the approach that I wanted to try in writing Vega Fusion. More questions? Looks like John. Thanks, everyone.